It's Freedom Files with James Burns on American Freedom Radio. Welcome to the show. You're listening to Freedom Files live on this Thursday afternoon. It is July 14th, 2011. I am your host, James Burns, along with Adam, our network producer, man, the hell back at AFRHQ in Austin, Texas. I am coming at you live from Shreveport, Louisiana. Big day today. It is Thursday. You know what that means? We're about to be joined by Bob Chapman, the international forecaster. His website, of course, is theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how have you been, sir? Well, pretty good, pretty good. A lot of stuff to talk about today. The the first thing uh, we'll, we'll do, we're going to talk about, of course, is the big issue going on. It's uh, everywhere right now, the debt ceiling. Uh, you have both sides having this little back-and-forth action. I think it's just a big old song and dance that's going on for uh, keeping the uh, masses distracted and, and fighting once, you know, each other as usual. Uh, what do you think the ramifications are going to be if this uh, ceiling is raised? Or, uh, on the flip side... What will happen if it uh, if they don't meet the deadline? Well, if they make a deal, it'll be uh, it'll be capitulation, and you know they're supposed to be compromise, and neither side is moving. The date that the legislation has to go forward is the 18th, which is next Monday. If they don't have a deal by then, that means the August 2nd deadline for signing won't be available. Uh, they've already incurred about $275 billion in costs running the government, which came out of the federal pension plan as well as Social Security and Medicare. You know, the same Social Security and Medicare that the extortionist in the White House told us the other day that we weren't going to get any more unless we told our congressman to vote for the debt extension. Anyway, the possibility is that they will have an agreement, and I don't think they will. I don't think they're even close. Uh, the next step, I think, uh, we're talking about uh, an extension, which they've talked about, probably to somewhere around October the 15th, and approximately. Uh, that will put that debt of the administration to the uh, funds from which they would, uh, drew them from uh, in the hawk for about $700 billion. And I certainly don't know how they're going to pay it back. I guess they'd fold more bonds than the Fed would have to buy them. And that's a substantial amount of money. I don't know what's coming in in revenues. That's hard to tell. But uh, be as it may, I don't think they'll get an agreement. I think they'll extend it. And they could extend it as much as they want, for those of you who don't know. Uh, he could u try to use an executive order, but I think it would be in the same Supreme Court within a week. And uh, if that happened, I think that the executive order would be nullified. But you don't know until you get there. Uh, you got to remember that 95% of the people who are involved in Congress and in the uh, judiciary are bought and paid for. So... You know, you, it's so hard to make decisions. All you can do is generalize as to the direction and the trend that things are going. And I, I, that's the best we can do. Um, I don't think there'll be a default. Uh, the reason why is that they just simply can't allow it unless they want it at this time. And I don't think they do because of the actions that I've seen by the President and the Secretary of the Treasury and some of these senators and congressmen, I can't believe how dumb they are. Some of the statements that have come out are just awful. They should be ashamed of themselves. But anyway, uh, it's really up in the air, but probably you'll get an extension. Bob, in your opinion, what do you think the best course of action is regarding the situation we're in right now, re you know, regarding the debt ceiling? Don't extend it. Let the economy go into a defla deflationary depression. Uh, purge the economy, which means uh, the banks 
and the brokerage houses, many of them will go bankrupt because they're already bankrupt. Uh, there will be a definite move to cancel out the Federal Reserve, and that job will be handed back to the Treasury Department. Uh, there will be a lot of changes. The revolving door between Wall Street and the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve in particular and other agencies as well has got to be stopped because they control our lives and when we don't agree with what they have to say they tell us well we'll destroy the market I mean that's what Paulson said three years ago look either do this or we're going to destroy the market and they warned him by having this uh, this uh, flash correction of a thousand points in 15 minutes and so that yes they can do that but let's take the opportunity out of their hands and let's let the economy go where it should go where it should have gone in 1992 I've been writing about this for a long time and they had every possibility in the world to do it in 92 and again in 2000 2001 but they do it too busy, you know, looting the public. And in that process, they didn't want to shut things down. Right now, they're trying to move things down the road so they don't have to deal with it this time. And yes, they can do that, but not indefinitely. And I expect that that's what they want to do with the debt extension, with this horrendous annualized debt that we're incurring as a, as a nation. I mean, as Ron Paul says, you know, we're broke. The country is bankrupt, and he's right. And so I think that that you, you're going to have these people struggling to continue the status quo. And I think they'll get away with it. Uh the people who are opposing because they want to uh, they want to see cuts made and that's normal uh the cuts that have been offered by the republicans are ridiculous 10 years which means after they leave office anything can happen they can be rescinded voted out whatever these decreases in spending and they're talking about chump change. And the Democrats are making like, oh, we've got to have tax increases. Well, you can start with the Rockefellers and so on and so forth, <laughs> if that's what you want to do. Because the classes of people in America under the upper middle class don't have anything. There's not much left to take. I mean, the prices of their home have been destroyed. Uh, many of them have lost 20, 30, 40 percent in their retirement funds, which are invested in the stock market. And they've never really had any kind of a strong recovery. And they were off at one time between 40 and 60 percent. I mean, what happens if the stock market goes to 3,000, where I think it's going to eventually go? Um, they don't have any retirement left anyway. If they're invested in American securities and bonds. I should say stocks and bonds. And that leads us to another conclusion. The only place that you can go that has any relative safety whatsoever is gold and silver coins, bullion, and shares. And that's it. There is nothing else. So keep that in mind. And gold and silver prices are going to go substantially higher. I haven't been on this program for a couple of weeks, but on the radio and in the publication, I've been saying that we just formed, because of the correction caused by the people who own the Federal Reserve, JPM, GS, C. I should tell you the names. All you people don't know those symbols. J.P. Morgan Chase, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, and there's many others involved. And they're not going to let that happen if they can help us. So what did they do? 
in March, they started to get ready to take the market down. In April, silver went to $50, and gold was around fifteen seventy or something like that. And they took that gold down to fourteen seventy five for a very short period of time. And they took silver down to thirty two and a half. Since that time, those support levels have been tested eight times. Now from a fundamental point of view historically, if you test two or three times it's usually Sufficient to tell you that you got a bottom. Could be temporary, but probably not. If you get four times, that's really, really, really strong. It's eight times this time. Because every time they tried to drive silver down to a new low, they were unsuccessful. Their position on the naked short side of the market is the same today as it was in April. So what they did is they covered their shorts to an extent, and then when silver got down to the 32, 33, 34 level, they went short again, trying to drive it to new lows, and they couldn't do it. So now they're stuck, in the banks I mentioned, with the same problem that they had before. And why do you think silver can go up a dollar or two dollars a day because they're so short. And everybody in the world who's involved in those markets certainly knows what their position is and what they're up to. We could have, based on history, an upward move in gold and silver of 100 to 150 times by the end of February. Wow. That's amazing. So what are we talking? 300 on one and 70 $80 on the other. And don't forget, gold and silver have been suppressed since August of 1988. If you take inflation from 1980 when gold was 850 and silver was $50, gold should be selling at $8,000 an ounce and silver around $375. And those are facts. And the reason that not selling in those realms is because of the suppression by the United States government, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, and a host of other central banks who were in on it all those years. You can go back and see the records. It's all there. And a lot of these foreign banks, what they did is they didn't sell. They leased their gold out. And then, of course, it was sold as soon as they leased it. And they were paid back with dollars. But the IMF allows them to still carry it on the books that they still own the gold when, in fact, they don't. It's already been sold. This is the games that they play. They don't have any physical they want to part with, none of the central banks at this point, because they've lost. And they know that. The question is, can they bluff their way through it? And in that process, they'll have another war, or a combination of wars. And that's what they're up to right now, to distract the people. And when all is said and done, they'll say, well, look, we had this terrible financial situation, and the economy got very bad, bad, but it was because of the war. They do it every time. They've done it for centuries. But their game is being exposed. So this time when they try to pull that stuff, they're not going to get away with it. I agree, Bob. I think that more people are waking up to their shenanigans, and I think that they're they're um, basically almost at the end of their rope. Uh, regarding gold and silver, do you think that if people haven't invested in gold and silver, now might be their last opportunity, or do you think that there might be another uh, downturn, or do you think that the sky is basically going to be the limit on this turnaround that we see right now? I don't see another downturn from these support levels. I do see upside, and a lot of things can happen in between, never mind war, uh, that would make gold go back to where it should be. I shouldn't say back, but go to where it should be at $8,000, because 
supposing this lasts another few years, they were able to keep this thing afloat, this thing being the European, British, and U.S. economies by creating money and credit. They could do that. But the flip side of that is, is inflation will be over 50%. So this is a Hobson's choice that they are faced with. Well, I know exactly what they're going to do. And that is they're going to have QE3 just like I predicted a year ago in May. They have to. They did about $2.4 trillion easy. And the figure may be much higher, but that's what I'm looking for right now because they got to buy the federal paper, the Treasury, and whatever market operation is necessary on the agency bonds, Fannie, Freddie, Ginny, FHA. And there'll be more toxic waste coming out of the banks, and they won't tell us what they pay for it or what it's worth, which is very interesting. Uh, Bob, we, to to, we have to go to break. Uh, Bob Chapman is my guest. His website is theinternationalforecaster.com. More of Bob Chapman coming up right after this. You're listening to Freedom Files on American Freedom Radio. Welcome back to the show. You are listening to Freedom Files live on this Thursday afternoon. It is July 14th, 2011. James Burns, along with Bob Chapman, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. And before the break, Bob was uh, talking about uh, QE3, uh, something that you, Bob, have been talking about for uh, a very long time now. Yes, and uh, I think uh, Wall Street uh, uh, gave the orders a long time ago that we got to have this, our, you know, it's going down, and uh, this is not the time for it to go down. And there's a lot more looting that has to be gone on. And, um, you know, they have to steal to the very end. And they've done that a number of times. And, um, and so uh, they, will, they will have to do that. And that probably will come about with, the, uh, with some sort of solution for the debt, short-term debt allowance, we'll call it. And um, in the meantime, uh, the uh, problems in Europe are preposterous. It's a long story, and uh, I started writing about it 14 years ago. But, you know, I experienced it. I lived in Europe for a long time, about uh, maybe almost 10 years, in different countries. I speak different languages as well. And I watched this whole thing mature and come to being uh, with the EEC and then the EU and then the Eurozone, and they tried so hard, but they weren't smart enough to make it happen and make it stick to form this European Union as well as the um, Eurozone. And, you know, I think a letter that I received today from Germany, and um, I got a very nice letter as well, in German from uh, a famous professor. And um, uh, I haven't read it as yet. But the lady who sent me the letter is French by birth. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it is so typical of, uh, of what goes on in Europe. And that is people are very locally dominant uh, the makeup of Europe is such because of the many, many tribes that live there through the centuries. To have a European Union is anthropologically unnatural. It's as simple as that. And this lady said to me, I was born French. I've lived in this country, Germany, for 30 years, but yet I will always be French. And that says it all. The European Union cannot work. They wanted it as a lead-in to world government. And, of course, the Eurozone, the Euro, the important thing about that was the, the one world currency, which they wanted the Euro to become. And the banks made loans far beyond which they should have. They knew better. 
And now they're stuck. They're all broke. There's going to be default. They're not going to get paid back. And most of the major groups in Europe, um, most of the major banks in Europe are going to go under. Some of the countries are as well, at least six of them. And in Eastern Europe, there's several as well that nobody ever talks about that are in dire straits. And they've been fudging the books for years. And the game is over. It's simply over. It might take three years to be phased out, but it's coming. And the experiment is dead. One of the parts of that experiment during the last century was the funding of Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. They were funded in part, or for the most part, by sources in England and the United States. And that money was funneled through companies that these people did business with in Germany. And quite frankly, I don't think Adolf Hitler ever had a clue to what they were doing. He being the main character. And I think that the 1930s, the funding and the formation of the National Socialist Government was a trial run for exactly what we got here today in America. All the same system symptoms, all the same kinds of laws, the usurpation of people's freedom, it's all there. And this has been a long time in planning. Unfortunately for these people, we know what they're doing. And we're telling everybody all over the world what they're doing. They can't win. Oh, it's going to be very dreadful. A lot of people are going to die, starve, if nothing else, during this period of time. The America that you've known before is gone. Gone. The bankers have taken it away from you. And the politicians and the people in business have aided and abetted the whole thing because they're getting paid to do it. So with that said, Europe's a goner. It's just a question of when. And in England and the U.S. will follow. And that's why it's so important to have in your freeze-dried, dehydrated food, a filter, a method of defending your family. All of that comes first. And if you have more funds beyond that, you buy gold and silver coins and shares. That's it. Absolutely, Bob. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Uh, before going across, back across the pond to the U.S., uh, I want to get your take on what's happening in Italy. It looks like the uh, IMF terrorists are going after Italy's uh, 2,400 tons of gold. Uh, is, is there no limit to the, uh, to the uh, criminality of the IMF, Bob? No, there isn't. The IMF was set up by New York bankers as well as the World Bank. And uh, what they uh, have set it up for is to loot unfortunate countries and put them into perpetual financial bondage. And uh, that's what they've done. Well, they were formed in 1944, but they really didn't get underway until 1948, uh, the year that the OSS became the CIA. And that kind of operated in limbo until 1953, when the National Security Agency was formed, and they, the CIA, were brought under NSA as well as all the military counterintelligence operations. I know. I was there, and I did that. So, uh, yes, they're professional looters. Today, they run around in five, $6,000 suits, uh, and they uh, have mountainous amounts of wealth because they've taken it from you one way or the other. And so uh, I think that the IMF may very well be after the gold in Italy, and I don't know that there's anybody there to stop them. I mean, the communists are out of power, and um, they've been very, very unsuccessful when they have been in power. And uh, Berlusconi and his party are controlled by the Illuminati, probably the communists as well. Uh, you have the um, Northern League, uh, 
which is in the uh, provinces of northern Italy, uh, but, you know, they're one of three major parties. I don't know how much uh, influence that they can have, but if they get a hold of that gold, I can promise you it'll be in the market. Uh, but maybe it won't. I mean, I haven't seen a gold sale through the European Central Bank probably for almost a year. I mean, there's been sales of gold to um, to make coins. But other than that, there's been no action. And they can sell, I think, about 500, 400 tons a year. And uh, that hasn't happened for three years or so. So there's rumors abounding that Italy may have uh, uh, lent the gold uh, to the Bank for International Settlements as collateral. I, I really don't know. And I find it hard to believe, but we'll see. Uh, moving back across the pond now to uh, the U.S., speaking of gold, I don't know if you had a chance to watch that little uh, five-minute back and forth between Ron Paul and uh, Ben Bernanke, but they were uh, discussing uh, uh, whether or not uh, gold is considered money. Of course, you had uh, Helicopter Ben, uh, establishment of uh, Fed head. Uh, he, he's like, oh, it's not money. It's no, no. We just, we just hold gold because it's tradition. <laughs> what are your thoughts about that, Bob? He must think we're a bunch of cretins. I mean, they hold it because it's there. Are you going to be kidding me? Only a moron would give such an answer, and he's not a moron, so he's lying. And uh, he'll he'll have to live that one down like he's having to live down the helicopter incident, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I know they only had five minutes to go back and forth, but I thought at the end, uh, Ron Paul smoked him pretty bad. He's like, well, well why don't you guys hold diamonds? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Ron is, uh, is running for the presidency, and he's going to go all the way this time, and uh, I just hope they don't kill him. And uh, he knows that. Yeah, I've, that, that's my big fear, too, is that they're going to, find some way to kill him and unfortunately they don't they don't have to make it look like they actually killed him they don't have to pull a JFK they have ways of uh, making him have a stroke or a heart attack and that's true times have changed and uh, the excuse is easy because of his age he's two two months younger than I, uh, older than I am yeah but you know, I mean, I, I look at Ron Paul, and even though he is 75, he is in phenomenal physical and mental shape. And a lot of people are concerned about that because it seems pretty obvious that when somebody goes into the White House, they age dramatically over the period that they're in the office. But you look at most of these guys like Clinton and Bush and Obama, uh, they didn't work anywhere as hard as Ron Paul has over his career. And I... I think Ron Paul could weather the storm a lot better than, than they have. Yeah, I think you're correct. It's intestinal fortitude. It's the attitude, I, I just won't give up. I mean, that's why I do programs today. I just will not give up. I will not allow them, as long as I'm able to try to stop them from doing what they want to do. And that's his attitude. It's probably part of what keeps them healthy too. Yeah, and, and that's and that's inspirational for the rest of us that you and Ron Paul and so many others in the movement that have been around for a while are are not retiring. You're not going away. You're not fading off. You're, you're staying into the fight to the end, whatever the cause is. And and I, I tell you, Bob, that inspires me to keep going. Well, I'm glad because we need younger people. And uh, somebody's got to take up. We're not going to live forever. That's for sure. You're absolutely right about that, Bob. And um, all this stuff really ties into the next question I want to inquire about. 
Uh, we got about two minutes till the next break. Uh, Moody's, uh, it looks like uh, they're keeping a serious eye on the U.S. over our, our debt situation, and uh, they're on a, putting us on a downgrade watch. Uh, what's going to be the outcome if Moody's does end up downgrading the U.S.? Well, I think that investors look at the dollar like it's the best of a bad lot, and they're going to continue to some extent to invest in dollar-denominated assets. But they all know that the U.S. is not a triple A, it's a triple B. And it's a charade, and uh, it'll go on until it doesn't go on anymore. When it'll be, I don't know, but it'll change. You wait and see. And so I I think that uh, it's a known factor that the value of the American dollar is nowhere near where it should be, which should be much lower. But, you know, as I said, they think it's the best of the bad lot. And, uh, you know, what are we looking at here? The nine major currencies over the past 11 years, each year, on average, have fallen more than 20% each year. And it's only a matter of time before the dollar falls as well. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Final segment with him coming up right after this. You're listening to Freedom Files on AFR. Going into the final segment this afternoon with Bob Chapman, theinternationalforecaster.com. This is his website. And uh, this is uh, something else that I'd like to get into, Bob, in the final moments we have left, going south of the border to uh, what's happening in Mexico, uh, this fallout from Operation Fast and Furious. In your opinion, do you think heads are actually going to roll, or or do you think they're just going to sweep this whole scandal under the rug? I think they'll uh, put it under the rug. Uh, The corruption in America is unprecedented. Uh, If you read uh, this last issue from yesterday... Of the international forecaster, the the crime has run wild, and nobody goes to jail, and they either neither admit nor deny under SEC rules and banking rules, and they get fined, and the companies pay the fines, not the individuals who essentially stole the money. Uh, you know, there were about a thousand executives and corporations who move the dates back illegally on their option positions in some of the biggest country companies in the United States. And none of them went to jail except one because he contested it. He said, I didn't do that. So they threw him in jail because he wasn't connected. And all the rest of them, they did nothing to them except find them. That's it. I mean, this is fraud. It's a criminal act. But it goes on and on and on. It just, nothing's going to happen. We just know further and more that our government is run by criminals. I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. It's, it's the plain truth. They are nothing more than a bunch of criminals, Bob. And it, it's sad it's, that the people are so blind to it. I mean, this hypocrisy that we've had for the past couple of months now. You had Attorney General Eric Holder out there saying, yes, uh, the reason why there's so much violence in Mexico is because of uh, guns uh, being uh, bought at gun shops and gun shows, <laughs> when it turns out that it was our own government that was sending the guns over there. And then, of course, now you have, it uh, looks like the president's going to be, uh, once again, uh, following W's footsteps of being executive order happy by uh, issuing another executive order to impose new gun laws so they're definitely uh, citing their uh, targets on the Second Amendment. It also will bring about their demise eventually. The American people will get pushed so far and they'll go berserk. It's a warrior nation, and they haven't forgot how to kill. And it's going to happen. Now, these people think they're all going to get away with this, and they're not. And there's going to be nobody there to save them, that's for sure. No, not at all. And I, I, don't, I really don't think that they're going to... That the people, I mean, I think some will probably hand over their firearms, 
But I think the majority of gun owners recognize the importance of having guns. They recognize why the founders, the framers, had the Second Amendment. It wasn't for hunting. It was for us to have the means to defend ourselves from criminals and, of course, a criminal government. And you're right. And uh, they're just pushing, and they're going to push too far. And uh, when they do that, people will say, well, I lost my house, my job, my vehicles. I'm living in a tent in some field someplace. I don't have anything left to lose. And so let's get together and let's take their weapons away from them, or let's dig up the weapons we buried, and uh, let's just uh, change things again. And that, that's the way we're heading, Bob. I mean... <laughs> where we're trying to peacefully bring about revolution in this country. But the fact is, the powers that be, they're not listening to us. They continue to uh, strip away whatever few liberties and freedoms we have left. They continue to shred the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And eventually, they're, they're heading us down a road where we're going to have no choice but to take up arms eventually. That's right. It's a natural extension of the fact that we don't have any, have any legal recourse the, the avenues of, of complaint have been shut off to us because the people in Congress are criminals and they've gotten paid off. And everybody knows it. And they go through this little dance. I, I think people are getting tired of it. They're getting fed up. They, they, they're starting to realize that all this activism, all this uh, voting and campaigning and everything that people do, the petitions and calling Congress is not working. It's not doing anything. And I think, honestly, I hate to say this, Bob, but we're getting closer and closer to, as you like to say, French Revolution time. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, I think that they may even be driving it in that direction. Who knows what their, what their intentions are. But uh, I, I do know this, that the military is not going to work with them. It's as simple as that. So whatever happens is not going to last long, because I think that there'll probably, in all likelihood, be a military coup. That would be interesting. Do you think that a military coup would would be uh, a good change, or do you think it would be much like the devil you know? Oh, no, no. This will be much different. The military knows exactly what's going on. You can scratch the Pentagon, because uh, they're on the other side. But everybody else is, for the most part, is on our side. So, you know, that's what uh, I find uh, encouraging. In fact, when I leave this program every Thursday, I go on the Marine Disquisition. And um, I talk to those people. And uh, they know what's going on now. I've been on that program for six years. And I did it for a reason. I'm a veteran, number one. Number two... Uh, I want them to know what's going on because nobody tells them anything. And also to help them with their investments. Well, that is most definitely encouraging that our men and women in uniform, when the time comes, most of them hopefully are going to stand with us and against them. And speaking of criminals, uh, what do we got going on in California? Oh, that's right. The uh, Bohemian Grove is now uh, happening. Uh, Bob, how much longer do you think that they're going to continue to have the Bohemian Grove, especially since it's been... Uh, basically drugging out into the uh, light of day by uh, Alex Jones and uh, so many others? They'll continue it. Uh, they think they're the masters of the universe, and they think they can do anything they want. And uh, for the most part, it's not only the, uh, the uh, discussion of world events and where they're going to take things, but also... It's about homosexuality. It's about Satan worship. So I don't know how far they're willing to go with this, but most of them are perverts. And so it plays right into their hands. How do you think that they feel about the fact that over the past 10 years alone, they've gone from basically being under the radar, rarely being reported, and now every, every summer in July it seems like they're continuing to attract a larger and larger crowd and attention. Do you think they like that, or do you think they wish that, uh, that they were once again allowed to uh, work in seclusion? 
No, they certainly would don't want you to know. And um, uh, this is another uh, another unfortunate circumstance of people who have worked for years and years on exposing them. And uh, that's the right thing to do. And now we know why they have these meetings for the, men- the things I just mentioned. And uh, there's some people who come from all over the world. And they go every year. They obviously uh, like the atmosphere. <laughs> to say the least, right, Bob? But I think eventually, like you were saying a moment ago, these, these people are going to get theirs in the end for what they've done to humanity. And in the final minute we have left, Bob, uh, how can people get the international forecaster? Well, the forecast is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world. It's published by email on Wednesdays and Saturdays. runs around 40 pages each time. We have a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the Internet. And everything that you need to know each week is in that publication. You can get a free introductory copy by going to theinternationalforecaster.com. The International, F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R.com. You can also go to www.intforecaster.com. Intforecaster.com. For those of you who would like to ask a question, get a copy of either issue or get a copy of our latest recommendations in gold and silver shares, email us at bob, B-O-B, at intforecaster.com. That's bob at intforecaster.com. You can also call toll-free 877-479-8178. That's 877-479-8178. Seven, eight, you can get either copy there. And all of those of you who want to become subscribers, they have free one-year subscriptions there, and the deal that they're offering is terrific. It absolutely is. Bob, thank you for so much for coming on the show. I will talk to you next week, sir. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone, and thanks for listening. <laughs>